so while we've been dealing with Justice Month and dealing with issues of justice, uh, along the way, I was rudely interrupted this week. I had a great plan for this Sunday. I had a sermon in mind, and I had a sermon title in mind, and things were coming together. And then I received the email. It intersected and interrupted my week. It came from a person who, who was part of this congregation a couple of years ago, him and his family, and then uh, after great personal tra tragedy after losing a young son of theirs, um, they, they left for Cape Town. I can't imagine why anyone would want to leave Gauteng. But anyway, be that as it may. Off they go to Cape Town. He had been up here two weeks ago, uh, him and his wife and that, and Jackie prayed for them after one of their services, uh, because just that week they were having to f confront someone who had, uh, in a way, in their mind, robbed them of a, of a moment in their lives. So when we speak about justice and we speak about the poor and the widows and orphans and we speak about uh, the wrongs out there, I came to realize after reading his email that we are in fact, many of us here today, feel that we too are in need of justice. Things that have happened in our lives that are unjust, where we ourselves have come face to face with injustice, and we find ourselves imprisoned in a place in which we feel life is not fair. And in fact, we are so imprisoned because of things that have happened to us. We are so imprisoned because of our need for revenge and justice against those who have hurt us or robbed us or stolen from us or have hurt us or abused us. That in our seeking revenge and wanting justice, in our cry for fairness and feel that the world has been unfair to us, we have become imprisoned. And so rightfully so, if God brings justice, does he not also bring justice to his people? And so I received this email from this guy. I'm going to be reading parts of his email. I met them for the first time when I was called to the hospital. Their little boy went in for an operation, a very simple operation. It should have been basically in and out. I got there just before this little boy died. Massive negligence. The very last thing they expected. And as, as I stood next to this little boy's bed in ICU and I looked at this beautiful little face, he looked so perfect in just so many ways. And later on in that week, we buried him. And so his mother and father have tried their best to fight for justice for their son against the doctor and hospitals. This is what he said. I listened to your message on justice last month via the podcast, and I've been wrestling with some issues of justice in my own life. It's becoming a lot clearer to me now that what we're only concerned with is with the justice that surrounds us. Justice somehow starts with an understanding that we are all equal. Some people are just born luckier than others. They may be healthier, wealthier, better looking, smarter, whatever it may be. But in the end, we are all equal. And when something bad happens to us, we always ask, why me? But the truth is, why not me? There are some people that will never experience happiness on earth, but this is not the end. With justice comes courage and selflessness, and I felt challenged over the last four years. Looking, was I looking for justice or was I looking for revenge? I guess my revenge was driven out of dishonesty and, cow and the cowardice behavior of the man that failed my son. Would my behavior have been different if it showed remorse and acknowledged our pain and his failure? Probably. But in looking for revenge, in looking for revenge, I discovered a lot of injustice over the years of how you'd failed many children. And whilst I used this to drive my revenge and seek justice 
for my boy, I never really sought, sought true justice for all children and all families impacted by this man's actions. Over the last couple of months, I've suffered with weakness and fear as I battled to embark on the journey of justice and wanted to abandon this process because I did not have the courage to see it through. And in fact, there are times when I wished I'd never started it at all. And while I still often feel like that, the world can only be a better place by people who seek justice. This normally comes at great personal expense and requires courage. My belief that I had the courage was wrong. I needed God more than ever, and I still need him. Maybe this is part of my journey. My wife and I had to testify for the first time, and we had to see the man that had failed our son and lied to us. She had amazing strength and courage and was unwavering in her testimony. She drew on God's strength and has more courage than I have at the moment. What I'm learning is that whilst we all want justice, it requires action, the song. However, justice is not selfish. Justice is not revenge. You need courage to bring justice, and true courage comes from God, especially when we are weak. As much as I want to bring this man to his knees, I must remember that it is God's job and not mine. I must remember that this man is a child of God. Maybe this is his journey to find God. In essence, teaching our children that justice takes action, action takes courage, and when that courage doesn't come from within, we draw on God. I'll be eternally grateful to Grace Point and what they have done for our family. And so maybe you here today, feeling that you're in a place where you are feeling brokenness, and pain, loss, or suffering, and you feel that it's unjust, and what you've had to go through is unfair. Maybe you're in a place here today when you are desperately looking for revenge or for justice over someone else's life. Maybe you're in a place, um, John Stott uh, writes uh, an, an incredible, well, he's an incredible author, um, I think, so anyway. Uh, and, and he speaks a bit about that, and, and um, he, he speaks in one of his books in that of the, of the beautiful uh, cross, uh, the uh, statue of Jesus that overlooks Rio de Janeiro. And um, he, he speaks about, uh, in one of his books, as he thinks about, as he thinks about that statue. And in the, in the moment, he speaks about this young guy who climbed literally out of the slums uh, of, of Brazil. And, and how he climbs the over 2,000 feet to get up the mountain and then onto the statue of Christ, the Christ of Corvado. After the difficult climb, Stott speaks and says, he finally reaches on the top of the statue and reaches the top of Christ. And then he speaks agonizingly to Jesus. He says, I've climbed up to meet you, Christ, from the filthy, confined quarters down there from the squalor and from the prison of my poverty, to put before you most respectfully these considerations. There are 900,000 of us down there in the slums of that splendid city. And you, do you remain here at Corcovado, surrounded by divine glory? Go down there to the favelas, the poor. Don't stay away from us. Live among us and give us new faith in you and in our Father. So Stott asks, what do you think Christ's response would be to that moment? And really it is this, that God sent his son Christ to live amongst us. That even in your place of pain and imprisonment, even in your place of doubt, even in your place of fear, even in your place where you feel that you're suffering injustice, God is there. The whole purpose of Christ's coming is that every corner, at every intersection of your life, of every part of your brokenness, of your depression, of your pain, of, of, your, of your being lost, of your sense of hopelessness, hopelessness of when you're wanting to give up, Christ is there. And sometimes you need to climb up the hill of Calvary and take a, a, a view from the cross of Christ as a reminder that he came for us, even in our imprisonment. 
even in our pain. So this is a message really for you today. If you right now find yourself in a place of brokenness or imprisonment, if you find yourself, yourself in a place of, of injustice, I want to quickly point just to three aspects of a person we find in the Old Testament, a guy called Joseph. Many of you might have heard the story of Joseph and you find it towards the end of Genesis. And I want to just quickly speak about how... Um, there was intense injustice in Joseph's life. So just three things about his life. One of them is the fact of how he obedient he was, but yet he was hated. I mean, he was seriously obedient. I mean, he would pretty much be standing before you going, understand this, I was a good guy. Like, I always did good. I, I didn't do the fall down drunk thing. I didn't, you know, take dry. I didn't do this. Whatever. I'm like, I really was obedient. I was obedient in terms of my parents. I was obedient at school, in school, whatever the case may be. I lived a pretty obedient life. But yet he was hated. And there are some people here today going, but Gary, I've, I, I've done everything. I've been a faithful wife. I've been a faithful husband. I've been a faithful employee or employer. I've been a faithful citizen. I've really always just been a bit. I've been a, I've been, generally, I've been a good person. Why is there a sense that there are so many people against me? Why is it that my friends are against me? Why is it that even my own family are against me? I've just tried my best. I've been obedient my whole life. Well, you see, when he was a teenager... Um, he grew up in an incredibly dysfunctional family. If you think your family is dysfunctional, go and read the Old Testament. There are a couple of families I could point you to that your family would be looking perfectly sane. Trust me. He grows up in a seriously dysfunctional family. Yeah, so Joseph walks with God. He's obedient. So much so. How, this is his obedience. He's a teenager. And God comes to him and says to him, listen, young man, you're so obedient. You've been such a good person. Let me tell you a bit about your life going forward reveals a bit of his life to him. So in, in, in Genesis 37, he's so obedient that his father, in fact, wants to honor him. And even although he's not the firstborn, he makes him the head of the household. Now what this generally meant as a reward for his obedience from his father, earthly father and heavenly father, was basically because the head of the household, he didn't have to do the daily chores like his other brothers. <laughs> Think about that for a moment if you've got kids. Taking the one kid, setting them aside and saying to him, you don't have to clean your, clean your room, you know, do the bed or anything like that. Your siblings have to do it all. How well would that go down in your family? I mean, just heaven forbid that you should at one moment, in a moment of weakness, show favor to one child and not to the others. Now, he has given them complete control over the household. Of course, the brothers go crazy, don't they? In fact, they decide to kill him. But instead of killing him, thanks to his youngest brother, they just, they just sell him into slavery. Don't you imagine that in that moment when they beat him up, his brothers beat him up, threw him in a pit, pulled him out the pit, and then when some people came past, they go, hey man, and they sold their own brother? Must he not have thought, how does this work? I'm obedient to God, I'm obedient to my father, I've done everything that I felt was right. How is it that people can hate me? It just doesn't seem fair. Not only that, uh, as you read a little bit later on, he was really honorable, but yet people kept on slandering against him. So we'll fast forward to another point in his life. It's like 11 years later. He's been a slave for 11 years. He's incredibly honorable. Even in his difficulty, even in being enslaved, he's honorable. So even in difficult situations, you'll find people, even amongst us here, that even in the difficulty of your marriage or even in the difficulty of your workplace or a family, or whatever, you remain honorable. But yet still, he was slandered. So he's this young adult slave working in the home of one of the high officials in the Egyptian court named Potiphar. Somewhere along the line, Joseph had decided that if life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Exactly. So he honored God, and he honored those who he worked for. He worked hard, and he did no matter what was assigned to him, he did it with diligence. And so he served Potiphar with integrity and hard work. And when opportunity came, he would even speak to Potiphar about Jehovah God. 
And so the Lord was with Joseph, and he continued to bless him and continued to honor him. And Potiphar noticed this and kept on um, giving him promotions um, and promotion and promotion of them until eventually um, he was promoted to be the head of Potiphar's household. And with it came a company car and a free cell phone and everything else that go, housing allowance and all the rest. It was just right. I mean, isn't that the way it's meant to turn out? If you're faithful and you serve God, he will bless you, shield you, and open doors for you. There are some people here who have honored God and who have been faithful to God, but still find themselves, in, and eventually are saying, God, seriously, where is the justice? I honor you, I serve you. I'm still poor, I'm still looking for a job, I'm still waiting for a contract. My child, whatever it may be, things are just going wrong for me, but God, I honor you. I work hard for you. I come to church every Sunday. I'll serve wherever I can. But we read and we know that even those who have godly character are still tested. But it's still possible to shine. And so Potiphar's wife, so now he's working hard. He's head of the household. He's honoring Potiphar. He's honoring God. I mean, seriously, God has opened up doors for him. He's now like the head of the household. But, of course, along comes Potiphar's wife, who made it her goal to seduce Joseph. She was the original cougar. (laughs) The Bible tells us in its most beautiful way that lust so gripped this woman that she threw caution to the wind. And even though she was married to Potiphar, and even though Joseph was a slave, she was not shy at all in the way she propositioned him to come to bed with her. I mean, she was forward like you have no idea. And as the days went by and the more Joseph said no to her, the crazier she went. And she became even more daring in her seductions. And then one night, one of those tactics nearly worked. She got rid of everyone in the household, gave them all leave for the day, told them not to come back until the next morning. The only person left in the house was herself and the man she desired, Joseph. And so Joseph, unsuspectingly so, walks into the house. Candles are lit. The lights are dimmed. Rose petals from the entrance into the bedroom. Michael Bublé playing (laughs) softly in the background. She rushes to him and she grabs him to drag him to bed. He gets such a fright in that moment and he's so determined to be honoring to God and honoring to Potiphar that he breaks himself loose from her grip. And as as he does that, he leaves his outer tunic in her hands and he literally is running through the house in his underpants to get away from her. He escapes. But in Genesis 39, we read how as she stands there with this garment in her hand and as he leaves, runs out the house, she calls the security, the soldiers, Look, she says, Pharaoh has brought a Hebrew Hebrew here amongst us to laugh at us. He came to lie with me. And when I cried out in a loud voice, when he heard my cry, he left his garment beside me and he ran out of the house. And then in verse 16, it speaks about how the next morning she actually puts out Joseph's tunic next to her in the bed, folds it, calls her husband Potiphar and says, what type of man is this? that lies with me in your bed. It's just unfair. And of course, Potiphar's wife just fans up um, Potiphar's hatred and anger and all the rest of it. And so he throws him into prison, a very special prison where the Pharaoh's prisoners are kept separately. Terrible conditions. Speaks about how his, his feet were hurt with fetters. In other words, they caned his feet. His neck was put in a collar of iron and he was left in a terrible position when in fact all he did was right, but yet Potiphar's wife is the one 
who gets away with it. Have you not felt that way sometimes? It feels like I've honored God. It feels like I've done everything right. It feels that I'm really, but life is just uphill. Nothing seems to be falling in place. How is it then that those who are crooks and those who are thieves and those who are whatever seem to have such brilliant lives? And yet somehow for me, my life is a nightmare. The injustice of it all. And lastly, we find that he's used by God, but actually forgotten. It comes a little while later, Joseph is finding himself in prison. Uh, and as I said, in prison with him, a whole lot of other of the, of the prisoners of the, of the Pharaoh. Uh, two of them are there. Um, one is the king's cupbearer. In other words, the one who brings the king his cup. To, every time the king wanted his son to drink, he'd be like, you know, and then he'd, you know, Jack's, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, <laughs> And, um, and basically, the guy brings the cup. Um, uh, and then there was the, his baker. And both of them um, irritated the king, so he threw them into jail uh, a little while later, and jo- they found Joseph there. In chapter 40, you, um, you find Joseph's unbelievable. So his brothers hate him. Okay, well, he's honored by God. Uh, his brothers hate him. He's done everything right. Brothers hate him. He's sold into slavery. He then just seeks to do everything right. He gets promoted, and then part of his wife um, tricks him into prison again. He's in prison now, and you find a little while later, after being committing himself and working hard, he actually becomes the top prisoner in the prison, basically looking after all the other prisoners. Um, and so it's incredible. But along the way, the king's cupbearer and the king's baker have these dreams. And they go to Joseph because he's known as a wise and said, can you please interpret the dreams? So Joseph says to the cupbearer, let's see, this is the deal. Your dream means this. Basically, in three days' time, you're going to be excused by the king. You're going to be released and you're going to find favor with the king again. Fantastic. The baker comes and says, this is my dream. <laughs> Joseph says to him, listen here. Um, basically, in three days' time, you're going to be hung and the ravens are going to eat your peck you, whatever the case may be. Very bad Pavlova the last time you made the king. You're going to die. It happens. The, the, the baker dies. And just as the cupbearer is released to go back to Pharaoh, Joseph pulls him aside. Can you just do me one favor? Could you please, God has helped me interpret this dream for you. You're being released. Now, when you get to see Pharaoh, please won't you tell him. Just put in a good word for me, man. This has really been hard. Being in prison, not easy. Please, can you help me? God has helped me to interpret your dream. Can you go and tell the king? Cupbearer goes, no problem. Joseph's like, at last, I can escape. I can get out of jail. So the cupbearer goes to the king, released, freed. Again, has a relationship with the king. He gets his job back as cupbearer and doesn't say a word about Joseph, even although Joseph interpreted his dream for him. For two years... Joseph stays in prison two more years. So you fast forward his life, and you'll find at every intersection of his life, no matter what happened to him, he honored God. No matter what happened to him, no matter what circumstances he came to, no matter what he was part of, he continuously honored and glorified God. He was always prepared to, and his mind was always, God, if I'm in this position, it must mean that there is a purpose for me here, and you need me to be your light, because if no one else is in this position, I have to be the one then that will always honor and glorify you. And God, I know at the end of the day, you will always be there for me. You will always, always Be there for me. No matter how dark my day is, no matter how long the darkness is, no matter how difficult the situation is, you will always be there. In the end of the day, God will make good. So now we fast forward all of this as I bring it to an end. Joseph is finally released from prison after interpreting one of Pharaoh's dreams. God does an incredible thing in his life. Pharaoh then basically makes him second in charge of everything. 
part of the dream was this, was that there's going to be seven good years for the Egyptians and then seven lean years. So he says, so the king puts him in charge of everything and says, okay, and Joseph for seven years piles up stores and, and grain and wheat and everything for seven years. While things are going well, they store everything. And then the seven lean years come, just as the prediction, in that, uh, the dream that Joseph interpreted for Pharaoh. And life is terrible. Little did he know that a little while later, his own brothers, remember from the beginning, came to Egypt to get bread and food because his fam their family was starving. And the very person that they needed bread and wine and everything else from was from their brother, Joseph. And as they stood before Joseph, they never even recognized him. And as they stood before him and begged him for provisions because the family was starving, the Bible speaks about how Joseph stood before them and how he was so overcome with emotion as he looked at his brothers. Love for them. That he actually had to excuse himself and go into another room and cry. And then come back and continue the conversation with them. He sends them back with many, many provisions, plus that gives them their money back. They come back again a little while later after another issue. And again they stand before him, and again he gives them more provisions, and again he gives them their money back. But then he says this to them. Once he reveals who he is, and it speaks about how for a long time they all embraced and loved and cried and in the, in the moment, he stood before them and he said this. What was meant for evil, God turns to good. What was meant for evil, God turns to good. So everyone here who finds himself here today in a broken situation, a marriage that is in tatters, a body that is broken. A relationship with your children that is almost non-existent. A financial situation that makes absolutely no sense. For those here who feel lost and lonely, for those who are desperate, hear this. God sees you. And God knows you. Now, for some of you, you have tried everything else, but you've never tried God. You've tried a lot of things in your life, but you've never tried God. You've always thought that other things could fix your marriage, or other things could fix your family, or other things could fix your business, and you've never tried God. I'm asking you, please, today to try God. And He will take everything that was meant for evil, and He will turn it into something good. That's a promise that he makes. And for those of you who have been God-honoring, who have served God, who have been faithful worshipers, who have been faithful in the Scriptures and still find themselves in desperate situations, today is a message of hope. God has not forgotten about you. He is here for you. Right here, right now. Remember this, God is for you. No one can be against you. What it takes, though, is today for you to give whatever it is that you have to God, whether it be your marriage or your family, yourself, and trust God. Trust God, and he will make things right. Let's pray for a moment. God, there are times in our lives when we have just been so desperate. Things have happened to us, God, that are just so unfair. We've been such, really tried to be good and tried to do things right, but people have abused us. People have taken advantage of us. People have hurt us. We have suffered, God. There are those of us who really have been obedient but somehow we find ourselves hated by others.
We know, Lord God, that sometimes we feel like we've been forgotten. Those closest to us, it feels like they just don't care anymore. And Lord God, Lord God, there are those of us here today, Lord God, who just have come to the end. But we pray, Father, for an iron faith that even when everything else goes wrong around us, we can acknowledge that you reign over all the details of our life. And that, Lord God, that you can take that which is meant for evil, Lord God, and you can make it good. You can make it good. Remember, as Joseph addressed his brothers and said to them, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So we speak that over people's lives around us that meant evil against us. And we know that God can use it for good. So Father, we give our lives to you. We give our situations to you. We give our marriages to you, our families, our health, everything that we have to you, God. So just in the minute that we've got left in the service, you might not have had an alone time with God for a long time. I want you to please, please can I ask you to trust God in this moment, in this place. And um, a prayer to God is really just like talking to God, like you talk to a friend. So I'm going to ask you in this moment to really trust God. And I'd like you to have a, situ a, a, a conversation with God. That we call prayer. I want you just to tell God about your situation and just ask God to intervene. And maybe, maybe nothing around you is going to change. But at the very least, you might change. You might have strength that you didn't even know you had. You may have purpose like you've never had before, faith like you've never had before, peace like you've never had before. But bring it to God today, I pray. Let's take a minute now. Speak to God. Today, God has heard your prayers. Today, God, today, God has heard your cries. And those who did things that were meant for evil in your life, God is going to use it for good. And so when you stand here today, stand knowing that God goes with you that God is with you and that God will never leave you nor forsake you. He has heard your prayers and together we say, Amen. Amen.